Right, so I think I'm going to start now. Um, so I'm here to give you a quick uh, update on uh, Xenonarm. So I, uh, I gave the first uh, public uh, talk about Xenonarm last year in August in San Diego, uh, Xen Summit and LinuxCon, uh, North America. Uh, so since then, 13 months have passed. So let's look at what happened during this time. So a lot of things happened, actually. Just one month after uh, Xen Summit, uh, in September, Xen support went upstream in Linux uh, 3.7 for ARM. A um, couple of months later, we had Xen running for, on the first real hardware that was a versatile Express Cortex A15 machine. In January this year, uh, Ian ported Xen to ARM V8, uh, compiling a 64 bit and running a 64 bit on uh, the ARM V8 emulator provided by ARM. In March, Citrix announced that it was going to join Linaro, that is a high-profile forum to do uh, open source development for the ARM ecosystem. And that is relevant because, uh, well, this way Citrix can make sure that um, Xen is well looked after and also play well with the other components. Of course, uh, the, the Linux kernel, but also bootloaders, uh, Grub, UFI, hardware description formats, and so on. In June, uh, Xen support for ARM64, that is uh, the way ARM V8 is called within the Linux kernel, uh, went upstream in Linux uh, 3.11. And in July, we released uh, Xen 4.3, that is the first hypervisor release to support both ARM 7 and ARM V8, 32-bit and 64-bit. So it's clearly lots of things happened during the last 13, 13 months from the technical point of view. Uh, but also a lot of things happened from the community point of view. So since August 2012, uh, 4,685 emails were sent containing ARM in the subject on Xendivel. So that means that if somebody sent an email about Xen on ARM with not ARM in the subject, it's not counted here. Um, it's still a lot for a project that is still rather small uh, and uh, kind of in an early stage. Uh, but more importantly, 39% of these emails are not from Citrix. That means that are not from the core team. Uh, and, of course, there are a lot of individuals, uh, Gmail accounts, uh, but there are also lots of companies that are clearly trying Xenonarm, evaluating Xenonarm, even helping out and sending patches. Some of these companies are listed here. Some of these companies are going to pre present afterwards uh, in this track. Um, so there are clearly a lot of interest on, on, on the project. Um, let's see the status. So today, uh, Xenon ARM support uh, the versatile Express Cortex 15, the ARM Dale board, and the ARM V8 uh, emulator. Uh, this is in 4.3. Now, in progress, we have a port to Caxida Midway, that is a quad-core Cortex 15 uh, SOC. Uh, Apply Micro Mustang, that is an ARM V8 64-bit platform. The QB board 2, that is a cheap uh, development board, uh, Cortex A7 based. Uh, Broadcom B15 and OMAP5, so lots of porting in progress. In terms of feature, what do we support? Uh, so Xen 4.3 um, supports all the basic life cycle operations, so you can create VM, destroy VM, reboot VM, pause VM, and so on. Uh, it also supports memory ballooning, so you can dynamically increase and decrease uh, the amount of memory of your VM and all the scheduler configuration and vCPU pinning. So um, Xen uh, has a uh, pluggable scheduler architecture, so you can uh, select which, uh, whatever scheduler you like across uh, a set, including uh, real-time schedulers. Uh, and they are very tweakable, so there are lots of parameters you can change. You can also pin vCPU to physical CPU, so you can say this virtual CPU get 100% of the time with this physical CPU. And this is all supported on Xenon ARM today, actually in the last release. Uh, Linux 3.11 uh, supports booting on Xenon ARM as DOM0 and as DOMU, 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, uh, it supports multiple vCPUs, or SMP in the guest side. And uh, it supports parvirtualized disk network and console, so the main core parvirtualized protocols. Uh, so what's coming in the next Xen release? Uh, Xen 4.4 uh, is going to be uh, out at the beginning of next year, January, January February uh, time frame. So we are looking towards uh, filling all the gaps that uh, we have today uh, to have uh, production ready Xen on ARM. Uh, so these are the main gaps that we have, that is 64-bit uh, guest support. 
So as so Lin Linux can run 64-bit on Xenon ARM, we don't have the tool support to be able to create uh, unprivileged 64-bit uh, virtual machines. Ian sent patch series, uh, on the, uh, patch series on this, so it should get in for four. Live migration, and there's going to be a talk later today on this subject uh, by Samsung, and I encourage you to uh, follow it. I also expect, uh, expected to uh, make it on time for 4.4. And finally, uh, the software UTLB. So the first two items on the list are pretty clear what they are. Uh, what, what is the software UTLB and why do we need it? Why is it important? Well, now it tends a clear and simple status update and a very convoluted explanation of uh, the software UTLB starts. Uh, there is a blog post, actually, on, uh, on blog.send.org with uh, a, a bit more information. Um, so the problem... Who's the guy in the picture? It's more fails. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is that uh, in, on ARM, uh, all the guests run with, in an HVM container, runs with nested paging enabled. This is using XEN terminology. Using ARM terminology, all the guests run with second stage translation. So that means that uh, <coughs> what uh, Linux sees as a physical address is not actually a physical address. It needs to be translated into a machine address. Um, and um, this is true also for DOM0. And uh, when DOM0 then go and programs a device to do DMA, it's going to use, well, the physical address it sees that are not the real physical addresses. So as a consequence, the, de the device is going to go and read or write the wrong set of pages ending up corrupting memory. Uh, so the best solution you can think of it would be to use an IOMMU driver, uh, for example, an SMU, SMMU for Android driver in XEN. Um, so this way XEN could use probably the same set of page tables it's using to set up the second stage translation for DOM0, also for the devices. So when the device is going to start, you know, is, uh, the, the DMA transfer, the IOMMU is going to translate the physical addresses into uh, machine addresses, and that, therefore everything is going to work. Uh, the device is going to end up reading or writing the correct set of pages. However, not all the SOCs have, have an, an IOMMU. And more importantly, we don't have a driver in Xen anyway for the IOMMU. Uh, so either way, we need another solution. So what we have been doing so far is to map uh, DOM0 memory one-to-one. -one. Uh, we call it the one-to-one -one workaround. That will be uh, to have physical addresses equal to machine addresses for DOM0 and DOM0 only. So this works because, of course, if the physical addresses are the same as machine addresses, DOM0 programs the devices with the correct address in the first place. Now, the problem with this approach, and the reason why we never liked it, is that it's a rigid solution because Xen is not free to allo allocate the memory for DOM0 uh, from any range in memory. It just need to select the same precise range it's going to assign then to DOM0. Um, it also prevents us from using ballooning in DOM0, so you cannot increase or decrease the memory of DOM0, or DOM0 otherwise you would break the one-to-one -one or add pages that are not belonging to, to the one-to-one. Page sharing. Page sharing is a feature that is not very commonly used in SAN deployments, uh, but um, uh, it also will break with the one-to-one. -one. Um, so, um, yeah. Most importantly, probably, probably the, the worst of, the, of these all, uh, limitations is about foreign grants. So when a guest frontends grants a page to the backend uh, to be used as part of the parabitalized protocols, so block, network, and so on, then the backend in DOM0 is going to map this page and then might or might not do DMA on it. So if this page belongs to another guest, of course, it's not going to be part of the one-to-one. -one. Therefore, if uh, it's going to be used to do DMA directly, it's going to break. Um, so for this reason, we were very unhappy about the solution. Uh, and we tried to improve the situation. Um, uh, by uh, porting the software UTLB driver uh, in Linux uh, to ARM and to auto-translate guest. So what I mean is, we already had, so first of all, software UTLB is, is a library of function in Linux. But when I say software UTLB, I mean the software UTLB XEN driver that uses this library of functions in Linux. 
and today it does it for PVGAST. Uh, to, uh, for, for, uh, this, it solves a, pre a similar problem that also PVGAST have, that is um, physical addresses do not correspond to machine addresses on x86 for PVGAST. Now, aside from porting it to ARM, there's also the, the problem that, uh, well, PVGAST are very different. They don't run uh, in an HPM container. They don't have nested paging. Uh, so it, it actually needs to be changed and modified to run uh, in this environment. Once that is done, the software will be, will be able to uh, uh, give you a layer of translation within Linux to translate physical addresses into machine addresses before doing a DMA transfer. And therefore, again, the device will be programmed with the right set of addresses from the start. And the translation is done cooperatively with the hypervisor. So in practice, the software will, be, will ask the hypervisor, what can I use? What is the translation of this address? and therefore then it will use the correct one from the start. Um, so how was it done in the first place? So first of all, there was a lot of memory coherency problem going from x86 to ARM because uh, there were a lot of assumptions made uh, on x86 that weren't holding true on ARM. So after fixing all these problems, uh, what, uh, what they did is introduce a new hypercore uh, so that Linux could allocate a set of pages pass them to the hypervisor, and the hypervisor would uh, make them continuous in machine address space. Uh, so make sure it's a buffer continuous in actual machine address space, and then return the machine address of, of the buffer to Linux. So now Linux has a safe buffer to use for DMA, and can use it to bounce all the DMA uh, requests into this buffer, knowing what is the right address of this, the, all the pages in the buffer. So, so the good side is we could uh, completely remove the one-to-one -one <coughs> workaround and at the same time use DMA, so you uh, use uh, the, or the driver for the network card without issues and so on. The bad side of this is it, uh, it introduces an additional mem copy for each DMA transfer. So clearly this was not an ideal solution, so we were still unhappy about, about it. So we tried to improve it further. So, so the problem is the additional mem copy. So how can we remove the additional mem copy? So, what we thought about doing was to dynamically translate a physical address of a page into a machine address by asking the hypervisor. Now, it's not that simple. First of all, uh, Xen doesn't make any guarantees. There's a physical uh, to machine mapping stays the same uh, during the runtime of, of a virtual machine. So it's not just about getting the current machine address of a, of a page, but it's also about pinning, like freezing the, the mapping, the physical to machine mapping of that page. Um, and, uh, and then obviously give it back to Linux. Linux would uh, uh, keep track of these pinned pages, uh, pages of well-known machine addresses uh, using a red black tree. So at this point, uh, the software UTLB would be able to use the original page that Linux allocated to do DMA. It didn't need to bounce uh, every time over the buffer anymore. Uh, the mem copy could be removed. However, the red black tree maintenance turn out, turns out to be expensive in Linux. Uh, and uh, in order to, uh, to do this translation, we had to do many guest virtual to machine and guest physical to machine translation in the hypervisor. All, un all uncached. As a, um, as a result, um, the CPU utilization increased, increased so much it was higher than in the mem copy case. Uh, so in fact, it was not the improvement we were hoping for. Uh, so, so this is what, uh, so of course we could have uh, kept going in this direction and trying to cache the translations uh, t uh, or uh, having a larger set of pages that we pin and we keep pinned in Linux or change the structure we use to keep track of these pinned pages, but maybe it was best to go back and uh, revisit our approach from the start. So if we go back to uh, uh, what are the problems with the one-to-one -one workaround, well, it's a rigid solution, but maybe we, it's time to uh, climb down the ivory tower we stuck ourselves in and uh, come to a compromise. So no ballooning in DOM0. Uh, actually, lots of uh, uh, Xen deployments today on x86 do not use ballooning in DOM0. A Xen server does not use ballooning in DOM0. So maybe it's not, I mean, such a big of a deal. Page sharing is the same way. Not many deployments use page sharing at all. 
so the only real problem among these four points is the last one. So we do need to be able to handle foreign grants. Uh, otherwise, we break current parabitalized uh, front and back end protocols. So the way we did it is, uh, so, this, uh, so we, we kept the one-to-one -one workaround, and we designed the software OTB for the start just to, I mean, for ARM, just to take care of the foreign grants problem. So if we do this, if we start from this assumption, then uh, we don't need any pin and pin hypercalls because the grant mapping itself already gives you back the machine address of uh, the grant being mapped. Uh, also, we can take lots of uh, shortcuts because uh, knowing that, well, the one-to-one -one workaround is in place and we only need to do lookups for foreign grants, that is a huge advantage. Finally, of course, the tree is going to be smaller because not all the DMA requests end up being, actually ju just a small portion of the DMA requests end up uh, being in, uh, involving foreign grants. So overall, the tree is smaller, the lookups are faster, the tree maintenance is faster, and so on. And of course, all of this is still avoidable if we, uh, we had an IOMMU driver or an IOMMU in the SOC. So uh, this, is, this last solution, we tested on a quad-core 1.5 gigahertz Cortex-A15 uh, Cortex with a one gigabit link. Uh, and the result is we finally had the same throughput as native and uh, as uh, Xenonarm with just the one-to-one -one workaround and nothing else. Uh, uh, with less than 2% of CPU utilization increase. That is exactly more, uh, I mean, what we were looking for in terms of performances uh, and, and uh, yeah, in terms of, yeah, as a solution. Now, uh, the patches, uh, the patches are out there. They're not in, uh, in Linux yet. So uh, initially, the work required some changes for the pin and unpin hypercall and so on. Well, the la latest version, because we dropped this part, is only a Linux side patch series. Uh, it's a big, uh, big, to be honest. Uh, so I'm not sure it's going to make it in the next merge window, but if it's not going to be uh, uh, 3.13, it's going to be 3.14. Yeah. Um, we have also the kernel trees available there. So enough about the software OTLB. Uh, so what's left to be done? So this was uh, the last item for the Xen 4.4 release. Uh, so, uh, what's missing? So, there is a lot of bug fixing and stabilization that, of course, we need. And even though we are a bit uh, far from the next release, uh, it would be good to start now. So, if, if you uh, try an arm on, uh, on your board and you find that there's a stability issue or there is a bug to be fixed, I encourage you to submit a patch and uh, we'll apply it as soon as possible. So benchmarks. Uh, so benchmarks is interesting, especially if you are, so if you are uh, working for a hardware SOC vendor, uh, you are trying to run ARM on, on your SOC, it would be very useful if you will run some benchmarks, maybe find some bottlenecks and fix them. So there are still a lot of uh, low hanging fruits here. Uh, so it, it's relatively easy to gain a 5 to 10% uh, of performance improvement by just fixing a couple of functions at the moment. So that, that would be also an, another area where you can help us. So the biggest item are the last four over there. Uh, so of course the, uh, the famous uh, IOMA view driver in Xen, and now you know why it's so important. Uh, device assignment is probably the last high level, I mean, um, high profile feature that we're missing. Uh, and uh, it's about assigning a device to a VM that is not DOM0. So the hypervisor has already all the capabilities needed to do it, but we don't have support in the tools. So you cannot go and write a nice configuration file and say this new VM has a network card. Uh, not yet. And finally, UFI and the CPI. So the, these are two technologies that are coming to ARM. Uh, UFI is relatively easy to support. A CPI has a different order of magnitude in terms of complexity. Uh, but we are working on it uh, within Linaro. So I'm going to use the last few minutes I have uh, to show you a quick demo. Um, so this is Xen booting on uh, Calxida Midway SOC. It's going a bit uh, quick, but I'm going to slow down. Uh, initializing Xen. And, uh, in a moment, I'm going to go back to the top. Yeah, uh, so this is Xen for the four, uh, so the unstable, uh, booting on uh, um, ARM 32 bit um, processor. Uh, the platform is uh, Calxida Midway. 
um, it found for physical CPUs and initialized physical CPU in the Xen hypervisor. So DOM0 is booting, Linux, uh, Linux 3.11 RC2. Um, going back and now I'm gonna just start a couple of VMs. So this is, uh, well as you know, you know the normal Excel uh, tool uh, that works on ARM, uh, listing one domain that is just DOM0 with 128 megabytes of RAM. One processor, uh, as you know, you don't need to assign uh, the same number of physical processor to in virtual processor to DOM0, so we just gave one. So this is a configuration of uh, uh, the first VM I'm about to create. So Builder Linux, it doesn't mean much actually in this case because uh, uh, we only have one type of guest. So this is mostly uh, useful on uh, x86 to dist distinguish between PV and HVM guest. You have kernel, uh, so we are specifying a kernel image, external. Memory, 512 megabyte. Disk, so that's interesting because, uh, um, so two virtual CPU, yes, and this. That's interesting because it's a physical partition. Uh, being a physical partition means that the front end is actually going to, basically the pages uh, passed by the front end to the back end are going to be used directly for DMA. In other words, without the software or TLB, it crashes. Um, now I'm going to create the VM. This is the bug output that you normally only get uh, using Xen console. I'm connected to the console. There are two processors, as you can see, in the guest. 512 megabytes of RAM. A network card. We got the IP. We can ping Google. Always a good sign. Now, starting a second VM. This one is different, as you can see. It's called SUSE. And in fact, it's an open SUSE. You see system D starting. It's an open SUSE um, virtual machine. Kernel 3.12. XenVM is the name of the virtual platform we export to virtual machines. There is a network card here as well. Now I'm just going up to retrieve the IP address of the first virtual machine so that I can show that they ping each other. <coughs> yeah, they ping each other and Google. Now I'm creating the last virtual machine. This one is also different. So uh, Julian here ported FreeBSD in his own spare time to ARM uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks. This actually demonstrates how, e how easy it is to port an an another operating system to ARM. And the reason is, uh, well, on ARM, we don't require invasive changes to the guest kernel. So actually, it's just a matter of writing a couple of new drivers. And yeah, that, that's why it was possible. Yeah, compiled with CLang. And yeah, we have a disk. And uh, yeah, it's FreeBSD for real. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. Now I, I, I was just uh, basically showing the vCPU pinning works. Uh, and the, uh, if you are already familiar with the vCPU pin command, uh, it's actually trivial. I mean, the uh, oh, vCPU pin that's, works exactly the same as on x86. So that's all. So if you have any questions. <coughs> So about the uh, software I/O TLB one-to-one -one workaround, uh, how is that going to work with driver domains? So, yes, so that's not going to work with driver domains. But if you want to use driver domain, you probably require an IOMMU anyway. So if you have an IOMMU, then it works. You, you don't need. Device assignment is going to require an IOMMU in the system. Okay, uh, but since we know there are SOCs that don't have an IOMMU available for this, that's... Yeah, so without an IOMMU, it's going to be very hard to have uh, uh, the driver domains. Uh, and another question, I suspect the answer will be the same. Uh, do you have problems with map DMA to granted memory if it's not contiguous? Uh, no, because the software OTB takes care of it. 
right. uh, but but that's using mem copy into contiguous memory uh, or by breaking the DMA. By so on the block layer, we force it to be basically only one page at a time. So okay, we, okay. yeah, that's actually an existing. It's an existing, yeah. Other questions? So I suggest we run over a bit and then we just eat for five minutes into the break and make sure that all the other sessions in the other room are aligned so everything will be five minutes late because we started five minutes late. Have you ever, tr have you ever tried uh, the term use partition uh, to mount in DOM0? I, I did try and uh, it works with the software you tell and what's the implication uh, is that DOM0 have its own buffer cache and DOM U have its own buffer cache. I mean, of and course. They, not, do not, they do not synchronize. So right. It may crash the entire file system. So, yes, of course, you're, uh, what, when I said yes, I didn't mean while the VM is running. Uh, so, it's not a good idea to mount the guest uh, partition DOM0 while the guest is running. I meant after or before you can mount it to install things or edit it. But. <coughs> Other questions? No? Well, thank you for the demo and the great talk, and maybe we don't have to be five minutes late. <laughs> <laughs>